I think we're good to go ahead and get started. Dale. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Libre. Um, I'll be moderating tonight. Um, bienvenido a todos. Uh, me llamo Libre. Um, mi pronombre son ellas. Um, and para los que hablan español, este, tenemos interpretación para hoy. Um, hay, eh, o sea, eh, tú puedes escoger, hay un globo, este, hay una opción para escoger un globo ahí abajo que dice interpretación y puedes escogerlo y elegir español para que los que hablan español o prefieren español eh, puedan escuchar en su idioma preferida. Entonces, um, eh, si tienes alguna pregunta, eh, tú puedes ponerlo en el chat. At, uh, for, for those that speak Spanish um, or for those that prefer Spanish, if you um, would like, we have interpretation for tonight. All you have to do is look for the globe at the bottom of your screen, um, click on it, and um, choose Spanish. Um, If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll do our best um, to answer them. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. This is the um, the first part in a series um, um, that we're gonna be doing, um, focusing on hybrid warfare um, and the zone of peace. Um, give me one second and I will share my screen. So, um, again, this is the first part of, uh, of a series where we're going to talk about, um, the zone of peace. We're going to explain what that means, um, throughout the presentation. Um, our focus is going to be on Puerto Rico in the global context, how hybrid warfare um, and different uh, um, forms of imperialism have been used um, to colonize Puerto Rico and the ways that we can imagine um, a, a future, what that might look like. Um, and so some things to keep in mind. Um, first of all, uh, this will be a recorded session. So if, um, if you do not uh, want to consent to um, your video, um, your image being used, please feel free to take yourself off a of video. Um, and um, yes, if you have any questions, there is a question and answer um, option um, in our chat. And you can feel free to put any questions that you would like um, to ask in there. We'll answer questions at the end. Um, We're going to go through the full presentation before we, we dive into these questions, but please feel free to, um, to put your questions in there. Um, and yes, so we're going to get ready um, to dive into today's presentation. Um, and I am going to get ready to um, hand it over. The thing that we want to keep in mind is um, language justice is justice. We want folks to speak slow because we do have interpretation um, from our comrades. Uh, that being said, it's not an easy task. So please be mindful of how fast you speak um, so that we can make sure that everybody um, is getting the message that we're trying to share. Um, so, uh, That being said, we're, we'll uh, dive into um, our first speakers for tonight. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, put them in the question and answer and we'll get to them. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Brianna and I'm a member of the Diaspora Palante Collective. 
We are an organization of Boricuas across the diaspora here in Turtle Island or so-called the United States. Our focus is on rematriation and building bridges between Boricuas and the diaspora and in our country. We do so through solidarity brigades where we bring people from the diaspora to our country to go and do solidarity work with people in our country that are doing the work on the grounds. Uh, we also focus on political education in the US and in the diaspora, across the diaspora. We focus on food sovereignty and more. And you can feel free to look us up on that diasporapalantecollective.org or at diasporapalantecollective on Instagram. Hey everybody, I'm uh, super excited to be here. I'm here um, on behalf of New York Political Resistance. Um, so New York Political Resistance, which is now, um, we have two chapters, Bronx Political Resistance and Brooklyn Political Resistance. Um, so we're right now a chapter of the National Political Resistance Alliance, uh, and we exist to educate, to organize, and to mobilize the diaspora and our allies for free and anti-imperialist Puerto Rico and for the rights and welfare of our communities here in the United States. Um, so as an organization, our four main principles are number one, decolonization through independence, two, the diaspora as integral to the fight for liberation, three, liberation as a human right and by any means necessary, and four, international solidarity. Um, and our Instagram handles right there in the bottom, <laughs> if you want to follow. Good evening, everybody. My name is Monisha. I'm here representing Soli Puerto Rico. It's an intersectional network of anti-imperialist Puerto Ricans and Puerto Rican organizations in the archipelago, as well as in the diaspora. We're dedicated to the labor of peace building through the development of a people's international relations and the strengthening of mutual solidarities. And Soli is part of a larger project called the Centro Solidario de Puerto Rico and it is the International Solidarity Program. Thank you. And now we will be having our comrade Austin from the Black Alliance for Peace uh, tell us a little bit more about the Zone of Peace and what the Black Alliance for Peace is. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, buenas noches a todos. Um, my name is Austin. I am a member of the Black Alliance for Peace and one of the co-coordinators of our Haiti Americas team. Um, so really, really happy to be here. Um, and, and really excited for this work, the Zone of Peace series, um, and very grateful for everyone, the, the hosts and everyone here um, who uh, is, is here to participate and to learn. So um, as Brianna said, uh, what, what is the Zone of Peace and, and what is BAP? So B Black Alliance for Peace, um, as some people may know, um, is an organization that was founded um, to really reinvigorate and, and revive the anti-imperialist and internationalist um, struggle and, and the kind of Black radical peace tradition struggle of Black and African organizing here um, in, in both the U.S., um, in the heart of empire, as well as um, internationally. Um, and so the Zone of Peace campaign, BAP was founded, <clears throat> excuse me, BAP was founded in 2017. Um, and the Zone of Peace campaign is something that we launched in 2023. So we actually launched that on April 4th, the anniversary um, of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the anniversary of his um, famous speech on, uh, against the Vietnam War. Um, we launched that campaign, um, a zone of peace in our Americas with organizations as well, with partner organizations in Washington, DC, in La Habana, Cuba, and in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, um, all simultaneously on that day. Um, and so, so what is a zone of peace? So you might have heard of this concept from CELAC, um, the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, which in 2014, in their meeting um, in La Habana, um, declared that the Americas should be a zone of peace, right? And so that means, you know, a zone um, of peace against war, 
against militarism um, and for justice and, and human thriving. Um, and so for us, what, what does it mean um, to, to actually think about that zone of peace from 2014 to now? Um, when Selak made that call, they were in a meeting of a head, in heads of state, right? And heads of state and government um, throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, what we are trying to do um, as a Black Alliance for Peace, as the Zone of Peace campaign and the many different organizations, um, all of whom here are, are represented, uh, or many of whom are represented here, uh, is to actually activate the popular movement element of the state-centered declaration of a Zone of Peace. So our goal is to actually activate, you know, movements, grassroots organizations, people-centered organizations under a different framework and to understand that we cannot have peace while there is injustice. There cannot be peace while there is still militarism, while there is imperialism, patriarchy, capitalism um, in, this, in this region, in the Americas, and throughout the globe. And so some of the objectives of the campaign are to really build this people-centered, anti-imperialist, anti-war, and pro-peace um, network um, and foundation to actually build alternative institutions and centers of power. Um, part of that is also to strengthen the America's wide consciousness among the people of our region, um, and then to establish a people-centered coordinating structure to facilitate expelling the nefarious imperialist forces of the US, the EU, and NATO, and their axis of domination from Nuestra America. And part of that is also to really focus on folks here in, in the U.S. where we're on base um, and where many of our folks in Black Alliance for Peace are based into understanding that we are also part of the Americas, um, that there is, you know, we particularly, the colonized, um, the racialized and the oppressed in this land are also part of the peoples of the Americas um, and that we need to act in solidarity based on where we are. So some of the demands of the Zone of Peace campaign, I'll run through a few of those core demands. And I believe my comrades here will talk a little bit about what that can look like in Puerto Rico as well. Um, so the first demand is to dismantle Southcom. So to shut down the 76 US military bases in the region. The second is to end US and NATO military exercises to close foreign bases, installations, and enclaves, as well as withdraw foreign occupation troops in the region. The third is to disband US, the US-sponsored terrorist uh, state's terrorist training facilities, to end the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Co Cooperation, WINSEC, which many people may know was formerly the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia, and to terminate all US as well as foreign training of police forces throughout the region. The fourth demand is to oppose all military invention into Haiti and to support a people-centered movement for democracy and self-determination in Haiti and throughout the region. The fifth demand is to return Guantanamo to Cuba. The United States must give back to the Cuban people and their government the territory that it currently illegally occupies. And the final demand is to recognize that sanctions are war and to end illegal sanctions and blockades of regional states including all economic warfare and lawfare, and to recognize the sovereignty of these peoples. And so see, these are initial demands. They're called initial demands because there are many more um, and many that, that might focus on you know, specific places and specific nations and peoples. Um, the last thing I'll close out with before, um, before going and, and passing it back on to my comrades is in the Zone of Peace campaign, we talk about many, many aspects of this campaign, as I already mentioned, uh, a people-centered human rights framework, but also the importance of being clear about anti-colonial struggle, right? And to oppose, and that requires us to oppose the accelerating aggression and the genocidal impulses of white supremacist imperialism that we are seeing all throughout the globe, from Palestine to the Congo, to Sudan, to Puerto Rico, to Cuba, to many, many places throughout the region, to Baltimore, to Atlanta, to places throughout the US as well. And it's clear that the framing of anti-colonial struggle, while maybe we have many sovereign states and we also still have many colonies as well as everyone on this call likely knows, but that means that we must oppose anti-colonial struggle everywhere, 
in order to actually end the imperialist reign and the imperialist grasp that currently exists. As folks may have seen recently, the U.S. has doubled down on the Monroe Doctrine in this year of the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine and is actually re is trying to reinvigorate the Monroe Doctrine through many different ways, through the Global Fragility Act, through many other um, methods and, and policies that are happening throughout the region. And so it's upon us and it's, it's incumbent on us to really be dedicated to this anti-colonial struggle, to connect our struggles. Um, and that's really what the zone of peace is about, is understanding that there can be no justice, there can be no peace, while um, imperialism, capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy still are the, the dominating forces of the day. So I'll close out there um, and just say to any folks, I think Brianna dropped it in the chat, you can find more on blackalliancefrpeace.com slash zone of peace. Um, you can join the campaign. Um, and most importantly, you can organize in, in your own communities and connect with all of us um, who are trying to build a zone of peace in the Americas and to reject US imperialism all throughout the globe. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, so welcome everyone to session one of the series. Here we're going to go over a brief overview of the militarization and colonial occupation of Puerto Rico. We'll have an interactive reflection of what could a zone of peace in Puerto Rico mean for the region and for the world. We'll talk about different ways that we can support each other in the struggle to liberate Puerto Rico. Um, and then we'll have an open discussion question and answer period. Next slide, please. Okay, so Austin mentioned the Monroe Doctrine and we're in the 200th year of that. So the Monroe Doctrine has a particular significance in the context of the colonization and militarization of Puerto Rico. You'll see here, it's written on the slide that the, the previous empires that had control over the region taught the United States a valuable lesson as to the strategic value of Puerto Rico militarily, politically, and economically in terms of how it might control access to the natural resources and labor um, within our region. And prior to, let me pull up my notes, prior to the US invasion of Puerto Rico as part of its war against Spain, um, the Monroe Doctrine was established in 1823, and the U.S. really didn't have the capacity, militarily speaking, to enforce the Monroe Doctrine. It wasn't until much later, after the success of the first Bolivarian Revolution, that certain empires were weakened enough that the U.S. could then flex its muscle. So, um, quoting here from um, an article related to Anthony Bourdain's 10th season of Parts Unknown, where he really got into um, the exploitation of Puerto Rico during his visit. So in, quoting that the Monroe Doctrine turned the U.S. military into the enforcer of North American business interests. Under the doctrine, Puerto Rico's annexation solved the need for a shipping port and a U.S. Navy base near the Panama Canal. Later in 1904, um, Theodore Roosevelt, who we all despise, um, added a corollary that extended the Monroe Doctrine's power to include the policing of the region. The quote from the article goes on to say that Puerto Rico became a laboratory for exploiting a workforce without a long tradition of working class organization and struggle already established. It was the perfect place to grow American businesses such as the tobacco and sugarcane industries, and it expanded the market for US industrial and agricultural products. The relevance of the territory and its uses have varied over the years, but it has always been a paradise for exploitation and profit generation. 
and it also became a lab for the U.S. and eventually NATO forces to further develop what we have all come to call hybrid warfare. Next slide, please. So when we think about hybrid warfare, we're pretty much in our audience, we're gonna be already familiar with that terminology, but we need to think of it a little bit differently in how it's applied to Puerto Rico. So the graphic that you see here comes from, on the bottom in the fine print, um, an article called Top Threat to Business, National Security and the American Dream, detailing the new global competitive model based on cyber and asymmetrical hybrid warfare from the Small Wars Journal of 2018. It was originally published in the Army Cyber Institute slash Cyber Defense Review. So this, this graphic, I think, really pulls out more detail than we usually discuss when we talk about hybrid warfare in its relationship to how it's deployed in our region. So we have the basic categories of economic warfare, kinetic warfare, political warfare, lawfare, psychological warfare, and so on. But this really parses out some of those aspects of each category. So as you look at this, um, I'm gonna read from um, another article that's from the NATO review of 2021. It's called Hybrid Warfare, New Threats, Complexity, and Trust as the Antidote. And I'll put links um, in the chat after I'm done. To put it simply, hybrid warfare entails an interplay or fusion of conventional as well as unconventional instruments of power and tools of subversion. These instruments or tools are blended in a synchronized manner to exploit the vulnerabilities of an antagonist and achieve synergistic effects. There are two distinct characteristics of hybrid warfare. First, the line between war and peacetime is rendered obscure. This means that it is hard to identify or discern the war threshold. War becomes elusive as it becomes difficult to operationalize it. The second defining characteristic of hybrid warfare relates to ambiguity and attribution. Hybrid attacks are generally marked by a lot of vagueness. Such obscurity is wittingly created and enlarged by the hybrid actors in order to complicate attribution as well as response. In other words, the country that is targeted is neither able to detect a hybrid attack, nor is it able to attribute it to a state that might be perpetrating or sponsoring it. By exploiting the thresholds of detection and attribution, the hybrid actor makes it difficult for the targeted state or targeted people to develop policy and strategic responses. This is relevant when we talk about how hybrid warfare is applied to Puerto Rico, but also how Puerto Rico is weaponized and how Puerto Rican minds, hearts, and bodies are weaponized to produce hybrid warfare for the imperial state because of our colonial context, because of the way that um, the US propaganda that's targeting the internal audience of the US shapes the understanding of how Puerto Rico exists under US colonial rule and what we think and feel about it. It obscures, just as it says in the article, and it creates vagueness um, so that the majority of the US peace movement or the global anti-imperialist movement is not aware of how hybrid warfare is being waged against Puerto Ricans and is not aware of how Puerto Ricans are participating in waging hybrid warfare against others. In future sessions, we're going to actually get into the nuts and bolts of various aspects of the hybrid warfare, specifically how they're being waged against us here in the archipelago how they're being um, waged in, in, throughout the rest of the region by the weaponization of, of our land and bodies. And with that, I wanna hand you over to Gabe who will go more intimately into how um, the militarization and colonization of Puerto Rico has unfolded over time. So keep this in mind as you listen to the rest of our panelists lessons um, because you might see, you might notice how some of these aspects of hybrid warfare are coming through. Um, so yeah, thanks. 
Thanks so much for that handoff, Monisha. A uh, great job, everyone, so far. Uh, thank you all for coming out and watching us. Uh, we're 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 getting into the weeds here. So uh, next, we're going to chat about the uh, Puerto Rico in the global context, um, and leading off from where we were talking about uh, Puerto Rico's geostrategic um, value um, in the age of imperialism and colonialization. Uh, Puerto Rico was established in the Western Hemisphere as a gateway to the New World. You can see that very clearly. It's right at the crux of the Lesser and Greater Antilles. And it provided a choke point uh, for the Spanish Empire to, um, um, in congruence with Cuba as a colony, as well as uh, Hispaniola as a colony, uh, essentially form a, a front and a jump off point for them to explore and exploit uh, the American supercontinent. Um, it was referred to as the Gibraltar of the Caribbean, um, and once again served as a choke point of control. Uh, post US annexation in 1898, Puerto Rico became the DOD headquarters, that's Department of Defense, for U.S. Army activities in the Antilles. Um, then from uh, 1902 to 1975, uh, Camp Roosevelt was established in Culebra, which is one of the islands in the Puerto Rican archipelago off of the uh, east coast and north of Vieques, and it was the precursor to Roosevelt Roads. Uh, uh, the precursor, Camp Roosevelt, was established by both the War Department, which was what the DOD was referred to as back then, as well as the Department of Labor under uh, uh, the New Deal and the Civilian Conservation Corps was essentially turned into a labor camp before it was built into a military camp. Um, and then later, once it uh, transgressed into Roosevelt Roads Naval Base, uh, which is currently the largest overseas U.S. naval installation in the world, and it has the longest airstrip in Latin America. It is also currently where Ukrainian pilots are being trained to fly and pilot AF-16 uh, jet fighter jets uh, for the war in Ukraine. Um, furthermore, uh, Vieques, another island in the Puerto Rican archipelago, was used as an amphibious assault training ground, as well as the Atlantic weapons training area, and is a bombing range for up to 60 years until protests uh, uh, caused the U.S. Navy to uh, to pull out from, from the island. Uh, as, as many of us already know, but I'd be happy to uh, go into it further, and we'll certainly expound upon it in, later on in the series, uh, Vieques to this day is still polluted by the munitions load that was left there by the U.S. Navy and uh, as they currently dispose of it. Um, we can uh, jump over to the next one. Thank you for that. So uh, full spectrum dominance uh, is something, uh, it's, it seems like quite a mouthful of a phrase. However, it's it's a military term and it is the cumulative effect of dominance in the air, land, maritime space and cyberspace. Um, and that permits the conduct of uh, joint operations between the United States and its military allies. Uh, just to get you a, a better idea, because that was a whole convolution of, of, of terms. Um, imagine you, uh, wanted to control an area. You wanted to control a region. But the the days of extensive borders and large swaths of territory being uh, controlled by marching armies is no longer. So what we have now is we have outposts and bases all around the world uh, that allow for the United States and its allies and its proxies to surveil and maintain dominance. So that can be everything ranging from Joint Base Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, uh, the Joint Base um, El 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 Elmendorf in Alaska, uh, Pine Gap in Australia, Stuttgart Air Base in Germany, Niger Air Base 201, the Demona Radar Base Facility in Israel, uh, Fort Buckner in Okinawa, uh, the US utilization of Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, um, just just think about where all those uh, dots lie on a map. It essentially allows for the United States and their allies to create an array, a matrix, really, of uh, surveillance and military might dominance. Um, so with Puerto Rico, uh, how that serves, it allows for uh, Southcom or South Command or essentially the US's, U.S. military's command of Latin America their strategic air bridge for the 156th wing, which is currently a unit of Puerto Rico's Air National Guard. It serves at Muniz Air National Guard Base. Um, they've served uh, quite a few uh, exercises in the past few years, and we're gonna go through them just to give you an idea 
of how crucial Puerto Rico is in the context. So just a few years ago in May of 2019, there was innovative readiness training. Um, and this one's a little more on the civil end. Uh, it's a civil and joint military program to improve military readiness uh, and to provide quality services to underserved communities in the United States. So while the exercise perf was performed in Puerto Rico, it the practice is for the deployment to be able to uh, happen throughout the United States or throughout the globe. Uh, the military is ready to provide that service, um, but once again, this is yes, this is a this is a conundrum, uh, an impasse that we we find ourselves uh, incongruent with as anti-imperialists. Um, so next, we have in April 2022, uh, the Puerto Rico Air National Guard uh, hosted uh, the exercise Tropic Thunder. Um, so uh, that that is was hosted uh, via um, a whole host of bases throughout uh, Puerto Rico, all around Puerto Rico. Uh, and uh, if we want to jump over to the next one. In August of 2022, the Army Reserve in Puerto Rico uh, served as a field detachment for a uh, field, sorry, field feeding detachment for a combat support training exercise at Fort McCoy in, in Wisconsin. So once again, while this didn't happen in Puerto Rico, uh, Puerto Rican men and women service service people have been serving, uh, have been deployed everywhere around the world, as we know, uh, but also are continuing to be utilized within exercises for the U.S. military and um Next, we have uh, in March of 2023, the Expeditionary Air Base was utilized uh, during Operation Forward Tiger. Once again, a Southcom exercise taking place in, throughout Latin America. Uh, in May of 2023, uh, the 597th Transportation Brigade. And this one is very illuminating. Um, this brigade, part of which is based in Puerto Rico, and they're used, utilized logistically to supply military bases on the largest part of uh, the Puerto Rican uh, archipelago, um, was involved in Exercise African Lion. Um, this was one of the um, more um, nascent uh, instances of Puerto Rico being connected to uh, an exercise in AFRICOM. Um, and this is because, as, as we've seen in the news, for those of us who, who keep a, a pulse on the radar, uh, globally, we see that the United States is is taking more noticeable action in Africa over the last 15 years. I'm sure we've all noticed. So that said, Puerto Rico's uh, position geostrategically is valuable once again as a jump off point for the United States toward Africa. Um, lastly, the uh, in June of 2023, uh, the Puerto Rico National Guard and other military service branches partnered with local and government agencies to conduct the Advisor Edge exercise to maximize capabilities and interoperability with partner nations. So that one is also very illuminating because from top to bottom, from military all the way down to law enforcement on the ground, uh, they are exercising congruence with one another, essentially showing that um, the police are an extension of empire. And that is something that they are have been preparing for, but it's certainly much more noticeable now. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, pass it off to Matt, who is going to be uh, giving us a little bit of foundational work, understanding of Puerto Rico's history as a colony. Just a quick reminder to speak slowly. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, Gabe. So when we um, study the history of Puerto Rico, we see that our people have been attempting to extricate themselves from colonial subjugation for a very long time. And that includes more than 125 years of resistance to US occupation. And in 1917, our people were absorbed into the U.S. citizenry so that 20,000 of our young men could be drafted to fight and die for the United States during the First World War. And by the 1930s, an emerging nationalist movement uh, adopted a militant and revolutionary program which sought to free Puerto Rico through labor strikes, mass organizing, and armed struggle. And in response, 
the United States met this challenge with massacres, as in Ponce and Antio Piedras in the 1930s, surveillance and military intervention uh, and imprisonment, as in Ayuya, Naranjito, Utuado, San Juan, uh, and elsewhere in the 1950s, psychological warfare, the sterilization of thousands of Puerto Rican women, and further assimilation into the American sphere through the imposition of our current political status in 1952, a political and economic arrangement benefiting the U.S. government, its military, and its commercial industries. And Puerto Ricans resisted this enduring colonial status through a multi-decade armed struggle, both on the islands and in the United States, through organizations like Ejército Popular Puricua, Los Macheteros, and Fuerza Armada de Liberación Nacional, the FALN, in the United States, which saw dozens of our people captured and imprisoned until sustained pressure could secure their freedom after decades of incarceration. And in the United States, Puerto Ricans, through organizations like the Nationalist Party, the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, and the Young Lords, have organized for their rights and their dignity to be treated as human beings in a thoroughly racist society, and have asserted ourselves in principled solidarity with all national liberation movements and colonized peoples, both inside and outside the United States. And during this entire century, the land and waters of Puerto Rico have served as a lab to experiment with weapons like napalm, Agent Orange, and depleted uranium, as well as a staging area to rehearse large-scale military exercises later applied in Guatemala in 1954, in the Dominican Republic in 1965, as well as the invasions of Grenada and Panama in the 1980s, and the bombings of Yugoslavia and Iraq in the 1990s and 2000s. Next slide, please. Actually, the previous slide, leave it. Uh, before we go into the 21st century, uh, a few uh, photos you can see of the uh, massacre in Ponce in the 1930s, as well as some of our historical uh, figures uh, uh, of the independence movement in Puerto Rico, uh, Pedro Albizu Campos of the Nationalist Party, Filiberto Ojeda Rios uh, of Los Macheteros, and Oscar Lopez Rivera of the FALN. And now I will pass it to Brianna, who will um, expound upon the contemporary history and conditions in Puerto Rico in the 21st century. Thank you. Okay, um, we can go to the next slide. So to elaborate on uh, what Matt was just talking about um, in Vieques and also as Gabriel had mentioned earlier, the U.S. Navy uh, was practicing on the island of Vieques from 1999 until 2003, when the people expelled the Navy from Vieques. Um, as folks had mentioned before, there was various types of warfare that was used, uh, most notably things like Agent Orange, the napalm, and uh, bombs that are still left across the island um, undetonated, making most of the island uninhabitable. Uh, like I said, the military was kicked out in 2003 after many protests um, and, and militant action taken by uh, Viaquenses uh, who were able to expel the, the Navy. We see extremely high cancer rates on the island of Vieques who still does not have a hospital after it was closed shortly after Hurricane Maria hit the islands. And these high cancer rates are from these undetonated bombs, also the depleted uranium, uh, the napalm, and all of the other chemical warfare that was used. And I'm gonna drop in the chat a link of demands that the Viacenses have uh, today. 
Moving forward in 2005, we see a student strike uh, that happened at the University of Puerto Rico. This strike was to demand that tuition was not increased. It lasted for 29 days and it was met with severe police brutality and repression. And this was not the first time that students had, had went on strike at the University of Puerto Rico. In 2010, there was another strike that lasted 62 days. And this was the first ever system-wide strike. All 11 campuses were on strike, including faculty, and parents were very supportive of the students striking as well. This strike was a success because of the heightened economic crisis, government opposition, Luis Fortunio was the governor at the time, and militant student organizing supported by faculty and parents. And I just want us to remember that a student's place is always in the revolution, especially in the University of Puerto Rico. Also in 2005, uh, the FBI assassinated one of our revolutionaries, Filiberto Ojeda Rios. He was the co-founder of Los Macheteros, as was mentioned earlier, and its predecessor, Las Fuerzas Armadas de Liberación Nacional Puerto Ricana. It was a clandestine group that committed attacks in Puerto Rico and in the US, including bombings and robberies, most notably the Aguila Blanca heist that happened in Hartford, Connecticut. He was killed on September 23rd, 2005 at his own home in Juan And September 23rd is a very significant date for Puerto Ricans as it is the anniversary of El Grito de Lares uh, when the Spaniards were uh, there was an uprising against Spaniard colonization. Moving into 2016, uh, we see President, former President Barack Obama pass into La Promesa, which stands for Puerto Rico Oversight, Management, and Economic Stability Act. PROMESA is essentially allowed for the La Junta, which is known as the Fiscal Control Board, uh, to come into place to help with our debt. Uh, and I say debt in quotes because in reality, we should not owe the United States any money. Um, we should in fact be paid reparations. Because of La Junta, which, which is an unelected board that's based in New York City, there have been cuts to hundreds of schools, over 600 cuts to hospitals, like we saw in Vieques and other social services to pay back this debt. There was a recent, a recent Washington Post article that came out about the high rates of deaths that are being seen in the archipelago right now as a result of the lack of healthcare services. For some people, it takes about two hours for an ambulance to arrive because of these budget cuts. There are less medical services and facilities for people, especially that are living in the campos in the country. And so this is extremely, this has extremely affected our people in more ways than one. Moving forward in 2019, we saw the Rique Renuncia protests, which called for or demanded the resignation of former governor Ricardo Rosello. Because of his corruption and also his negligence during Hurricane Maria, this happened after text messages were leaked, um, saying extremely misogynistic, homophobic things, along with making fun of the dead that, that died during the hurricane. After two weeks of protests, people finally demanded his resignation and he left. And now we currently see Pedro Peluisi, uh, the current governor, who is also a puppet governor of the United States, in power, and nothing has changed. I also want to mention uh, now in 2023, we are moving through an era of privatization. So there is a lot of privatization of um, our beaches, which are supposed to be public by law in Puerto Rico. And also a lot of gentrification through Act 60, which was passed shortly after Hurricane Maria. And we see people like Brock Pierce, Logan Paul, and other crypto colonizers that have moved to our country in order to take advantage of this tax law 
that allows for people that are that allows for foreigners to come to our country to open up businesses and pay 0% capital gains tax. And this has allowed for an influx of people to come in and buy up lands and buy up our resources to use it for their own well-being. Uh, next slide, please. And so here you have a few photos of the history I was just talking about. Uh, in the top left corner, we see the protests that were demanding the, the uh, governor's resignation in 2019. In the bottom photo, you see protests for independence and also against Luma. Luma is the privatized electric grid company. It's a US and Canadian company um, that has completely privatized the electric grid, which caused a lot of deaths uh, during Hurricane Maria and after Hurricane Fiona as well. And then in the top right corner, we see the protests that were happening, happening in Vieques. Uh, I call this Carlos Ventura versus the US Navy. And this photo, as I mentioned to some comrades before, reminds me of those photos that we see of Palestinian children throwing rocks at Israeli tanks, um, kind of this David and Goliath situation. Um, and it just really makes me proud to, to see how hard our people fight against all odds. Next slide. And I'm gonna pass it over to Alicia to talk us through what a zone of peace in Puerto Rico means for the Americas and for the world. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess just kind of to summarize, you know, within this series, um, you know, this is of course the first of, of, uh, of this series, you know, we're talking about why does, Puerto Rico need a, a zone of peace, um, thinking about, you know, the use of hybrid warfare, full spectrum dominance, 200 years, you know, of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and so I think, you know, I guess kind of in this portion, want to think about all kind of all these, what, you know, what's just been said and think about, um, you know, what, again, what does, so what does a zone of peace in Puerto Rico mean for the Americas in the world? And so this is kind of, um, an open question right now. I'd love to hear from um, other Boricuas kind of um, to kind of reimagine what, you know, what this can mean. Um, so I want to give maybe a minute or two if, if folks want to, you know, put it in the, the chat um, to kind of start thinking about, um, you know, thinking from this kind of liberatory, <laughs> creative, you know, minds to kind of um, imagine what, um, what could this look like in, in Puerto Rico. So I'm gonna leave it um, a couple, maybe like a minute to kind of um, think about that. And I'll be back. <laughs> Okay, so um, folks can continue to, you know, put that in the Q and the Q and A portion um, to kind of think about this. Um, but we got a couple, I guess, comments. Um, so I guess we can move to the next slide. Um, 
okay, so thinking about, you know, what is the zone of peace? Um, what could this look like? And so um, one example of that, you know, um, oh, I think it's got cut off at the bottom. <laughs> um, okay, it says, uh, it might be cut off, but basically thinking about, you know, no more deportations, um, no more no more ICE and true Caribbean solidarity um, can be built. I think, you know, um, when we think about um, the, you know, the Caribbean as a whole, um, uh, the 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 role of of the United States um, and you know us being a colony kind of very much prevents that um, you know autonomy to be able to actually support the Caribbean. So there, there's an article here that talks about this is last year um, in 2022. But about you know uh, how uh, uh, more than a hundred Haitian migrants were found um, in one of the smaller like islands you know um, in the archipelago without resources they're you know trying to um, find refuge and so thinking about what a zone of peace could look like um, in the Caribbean could mean you know being able to build you know Caribbean solidarity thinking about Betances, um dream for uh, for a united um, Caribbean for um, or across the Antilles. Um, this is something that we can kind of start to imagine, you know, once we have, um, again, no, no more ice <laughs> is out and we can kind of build with other Caribbean nations in, in, um, the region. I can also put these, this article in chat. So that's one, one kind of example of what, what could a zone of peace, um, tangibly look like, uh, in Puerto Rico. Um, so thinking about, um, the Caribbean, I guess we can go to the next slide um thinking about you know what could a zone of peace look like in the caribbean we can also think about what could a zone of peace look like internationally you know the international role we've talked about how important uh a you know it's uh, how important puerto rico is kind of as a strategic pawn in u.s imperial wars um thinking about you know lo like locationally similarly to the philippines um hawaii that sort of thing and so um we know that Puerto Rico has been used, you know, for also counterintelligence trainings. Um, and so a zone of peace could also look like an end to counterintelligence, um, you know, being used throughout the, the, the world and throughout, you know, the U.S. kind of proxy wars. Oops, let me slow down. I'm going to pause for a second <laughs> for the interpreter. My apologies. So, um, and this article, this is uh, fairly recently as well. And this is the, um, this year basically hosted uh, the year's, the year's largest army counterintelligence exercise. Um, and so a, a zone of peace could mean an end to the use of, of Puerto Rico for counterintelligence um, being used across on a global sense in the Caribbean and also in global sense. Um, so to continue, and I'm going to kind of, this one in the next slide also thinks in kind of what a zone of peace could look like, you know, um, across the U.S. Um, but um, again, thinking about Puerto Rico being used as a pawn for U.S. imperialist wars. Um, earlier was mentioned uh, the School of America's now WINSEC. Um, and how Puerto Ricans have been uh, historically the largest, you know, Spanish speaking um, people recruited into the US military um, with a very particular role in the activities of School of Americas or WINSEC now. Um, and so, and also thinking about, you know, formerly what was mentioned, um, Southcom, AFRICOM. So basically, you know, using our, um, people as kind of pawns for these imperialist wars. The the example here talks about um, how Puerto Ricans, the National Guard, were kind of sent to Poland, a lot of kind of throughout the East, um, East Eastern Europe uh, in support of Ukraine. Um, and also thinking about how, you know, this continuation of taking our land and our people um, for these imperialist wars, uh, more recently, you know, they were also testing or training pilots uh, in um, 
in Puerto Rico for, you know, for this the Ukrainian war. And so um, thinking about what could, what could uh, a zone of peace look like would mean an end to using Puerto Ricans um, as pawns in an imperialist war. And so just to kind of get, start thinking about, you know, uh, yeah, just start kind of imagining what the potential for a zone of peace could look like, um, be, you know, once these kind of um, structures are dismantled and thinking about how strategic um, and how important Puerto Rico is in the imperialist, um, you know, framework for the United States. And so with that and kind of getting our minds wrapped around of that, I'm going to pass it on to Diva to talk about kind of some next steps and what to think about. Hola, buenas tardes, y'all. Um, next, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. My name is Diva, and I am a member of the Diaspora Palante Collective, and I hope everyone has enjoyed this presentation up to this point. So what I want to talk about with this slide is what can you do to support? For, um, for those who would like to support in any way, you can join the Zone of Peace campaign with the Black Alliance for Peace. Um, you can publish statements and organize protests in solidarity with the independence of Puerto Rico. You can share and promote the work of organizations in Puerto Rico and the diaspora. Call on community members and organizations to contact their elected officials and demand a free and independent Puerto Rico. You can also donate to materially Sorry, you can donate materially to support groups that are organizing on the island. You can also join an, an anti-imperialist organization or learn more with us in future sessions of our Zone of Peace series. Next slide, please. Next slide, okay. And as y'all can see, I've, I came up with a slide of groups and movements to support. And for those of you who want to know more, just click on this link tree on the right for more information on these groups or organizations to follow or support. They can be found on social media. And Brianna posted the link in the chat. Next, please. Okay, and so to wrap up this presentation, I would like to share this quote from Dr. Pedro Albizu Campos. The revolution to establish the independence of the homeland has never failed. The time it takes to claim its sovereignty from foreign interventions does not matter. In an era of destructive climate change and an increasing fascism, it is crucial for our people and our allies to come together and start building a future for our homeland. The time for action is now. Que vive Borica en libre y socialista. Thank y'all. Thank you, thank you um, to, um, to all our participants, um, to all our panelists. It's been Amazing. Um, again, this is the first of a series. Um, we we will continue this discussion on uh, the creation of a zone of peace, um, and dive into the different aspects um of hybrid warfare. Um, we're gonna allow time right now for folks to um post questions in um the Q and A section um and uh in the chat which is now open um so if uh folks would like to uh, make any comments or have any questions please feel free um uh, we'll also take the time to share our solidarity with the people of palestine that are um, also fighting settler colonialism um and express our solidarity um with those in palestine in congo in sudan um, in Tigray um, and other places that are facing genocide um, uh, today. Um, and just to, um, Libre, if you could go next slide, there's one more. 
Um, so our demand, we want to have have a demand um, at the end of every teach-in, um, just so we can yeah make that kind of clear. And the demand for this teach-in is the demilitarization of Puerto Rico reparations and the revitalization of our lands, um, especially whenever thinking about Vieques and Culebra, but the entire archipelago as a whole. Um, I'm gonna read through some of the comments that we had for um, what a zone of peace would look like, just so we can have them on the recording. And then we can do a Q&A afterwards. So let me go in. So let's see. Some folks said our elders would be able to live until 100. Our bodies wouldn't be used for research anymore. Uh, Las costas abiertas, so the, the open coast, entre los pueblos antilianos, um, in between the, the Antillian people, or yeah. Um, someone said this could be a model for so many other indigenous groups dealing with settler colonialism across the global south. It could increase regional and global solidarity, leading to multiple reparation processes. And let me go through the chat. No more blockades, sanctions, Monroe Doctrine. A zone of peace in Puerto Rico is a zone of justice where our sovereignty is respected by the global north, where material solidarity with our struggle is not contingent on compliance with the colonial nonprofit industrial complex. Free and accessible health care to all. A beautiful circle of bomba dancers where people will be able to eat quality food of what they harvest and schools will have only have 15 students per classroom and all our teachers will have dignifying wages. No more US bases on our lands. And I believe that was all of the comments. Um, and if folks want to type any ideas or thoughts they have in the chat, that would be great. And also if folks have any questions to please um, type them in the chat as well and we can answer those. Yeah, we um we have one um for Americans traveling to Puerto Rico, um are we further worsening the gentrification problem by staying at Airbnbs? Is it better to stay at hotels instead of Airbnbs? Are there other ways to be mindful when traveling to Puerto Rico as tourists? So um we have some. Uh, I see we have Monisha, Kamra, Monisha, and Bri. Monisha, you can go first. Oh, thank you. Um, I I love this question. Thank you so much for asking it. It's a question that many of us get often, um, and it's complicated <laughs> because um, we are a people who love to share our culture. We want to welcome people from all over the place to come dance with us, come eat with us, come visit in a in a beautiful, respectful way. You know come build relationship, come become part of our family. Um, we do have the gentrification problem with the Airbnbs. We do have the housing crisis because of the, the just vast amount of, of land grabbing and property grabbing that's going on. So I think um, it, what I've been recommending to people, um, particularly people who know me personally and ask the question, um, there are there are places that are Boricua owned. Um, it can be a little tricky to do the research in advance to find out where, but they do exist. So I definitely recommend that. Um, and um, I think when one aspect of being mindful when you visit is that Puerto Rico is not San Juan, um, and <laughs> um, don't rent the golf carts, please. Many of us hate the golf carts. Um, the scooters. Um, yeah, there's lot. There's lots of ways to answer that. Um, if you're coming on vacation, like, try to come for solidarity, please. First, try to reach out to any of the groups that Diva mentioned on their slide. Try to reach out and ask if you can come volunteer. If there are those types of ways of being helpful before coming, just to consume our our land and culture for a vacation um yeah that's all i got thanks 
You took the words out of my mouth, so I'm going to retire my hand. <laughs> okay. Um, we, uh, we have one more um, from Hope. Uh, I'm a body going back to Puerto Rico over the next two weeks. Please share any suggestions uh, you all may have of local organizations to visit slash connect with while I'm there that share these revolutionary ideologies. I can go. Um, yeah, Hope, if you, uh, I'm not sure if you RSVP'd, but I can definitely um, send you an email with some contacts um, that you can reach out to. Um, there's definitely a lot of different organizations uh, that you could do work with, depending on what your interests are, right? So there's people that do food sovereignty work um, that are working in farms. Um, there are people doing med medical sovereignty, solidarity projects um, like Monisha. Uh, there are people like La Jornada Se Acabaron Las Promesas who are doing uh, political work. Uh, similarly, La Colectiva Feminista, which is a feminist collective, um, doing similar work. So I can definitely send you an email um, and DM you a few organizations that you could get in contact with during your time and safe travels back to the homeland. Perfect. I'll send you an email. Yeah. And just to follow up, like anybody was like, we need to be going back. There are 6 million of us outside of our country, 3.2 in our country. Like we need to go back home. Um, and in a responsible way, building towards a socialist and free country. Monisha? Thanks. Yeah. You know, I think, too, something that we can look at moving forward is developing um, solidarity trips for folks to come who do want to come in a good way, who want to come to learn and, and not just consume. Um, so that's another thing to think about. Um, we obviously don't have the material capacity to do that at this time, but we can continue the conversation and see what's possible in the future. So maybe save your, your trip if you're not a, a rematriating Boricua or a, you know, a first time returning uh, Puerto Rican, and you're interested in learning more about solidarity with Puerto Rico, let's stay in touch and let's keep talking about maybe developing a, a solidarity delegation to come. And that's one way that we can we can accomplish that together. Um, muchísimas gracias. Thank you for sharing that, Conrad. Um, uh, we have another um, question from um, from Gabriel. The U.S. has taken over some of our historic and natural landmarks, for example, El Morro, El Yunque. How could we bring attention to the issue and fight for our right to administer our own pat patrimony? If anybody else wants to answer, feel free. Um. I, I think this is a great question. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking about right now is the Cueva del Indio that was uh, recently privatized and also Boricuas were, or Puerto Ricans were making people pay, uh, people that are Puerto Rican um, to pay like $20, I think, to get into the cave. And they also began building on top of it. Um, so they raised awareness on social media first and foremost, and also by having protests there. And I think that's a really good way to do this. I think similarly to the issue of the privatization of our beaches where people have set up camps um, to kind of make, uh, I guess make a statement with that, but also to not allow it to happen. I think these are very good ways to uh, bring attention to this issue and also fight for kind of that right uh, to take these things back over. I, don't, I do think it'll be a difficult and a long process, but I think, you know, for whoever is there to kind of start a campaign like this, to bring awareness to it and to figure out, you know, what are some strategies and tactics that we can use to uh, return those to Puerto Rican hands. But I will say there's also an issue of Puerto Ricans that are going to do things for money and Puerto Ricans that are going to do things because they love the land. 
So that's another thing that we have to kind of continue to think about. Um, and I'll, I'll give it to Gabe. Real quick, y'all. <clears throat> and it's something that tentatively uh, I would love to uh, approach as, as an org and also in alliance with other orgs uh, who are looking to bring attention to this sort of thing in solidarity with us. Uh, but uh, where I live in Athens, Georgia, it's about an hour out from Atlanta. Uh, it is home as of a couple of years ago. It is home to over, I believe, uh, over a thousand pieces of uh, artifacts between Puerto Rico, Culebra, and Vieques. Uh, so the United States Navy confiscated thousands of artifacts dating all the way back to 6,000 years ago. And now they are here at the archaeology lab at the University of Georgia. Um, it, it's, it's almost, it almost feels silly that they would just be dropped. And I'm going to put a link here in the, in the uh, chat for everyone to see um, that everyone would, uh, all these things that mean so much to us and our island and our people and our culture back home that they would be here in some like backwood town in in Georgia. Uh, but you have to remember uh, one of the tenets of colonization is erasure. They are uh, erasing not only indigeneity, uh, but just a native uh, residency of the island in general. Um, so long as our people are being socioeconomically displaced, priced out, pushed out of the island, um, they are able to regard our existence as something that is like disappearing or gone. And so that's why they're able to take thousands of artifacts from our entire history of this island. And so I think something that would be prescient for us to do in, in the in the future would be to have a mass direct action here. And I do have a solidarity group here in Athens and we uh, maintain a lot of the, the work done for Cop City in this area in North Georgia. Um, so we have uh, a, solidar a solidarity group along with the SJP here, who is like also aligned with us and willing to mobilize. So if that's something we'd like to bring our attention to at some point in the future, um, we, we definitely are ready to work about it. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just jump in. I think um, Brianna and Gabe, I really appreciated what you both said. I'll add in on, on the campaign, on, on the Zone of Peace campaign. We recently had um, a, a webinar with our comrades in Black Lines for Peace in Baltimore talking about community control and what a Zone of Peace, how a Zone of Peace can contribute to community control um, of, of various institutions, of, of economic resources, of culture um, in Baltimore. Um, and we know that Baltimore is facing the threat of a cop city as well. And so I'm really happy that Gabe mentioned the connection um, between you know the organizers that are doing um, that that are working against Cop City in Atlanta um, and across other aspects, and I think that really points to the importance not not only of the Zone of Peace campaign but just of connecting our struggles. Um, as as we know, or as many people know, in you know in in Gaza, the you know libraries and universities are being destroyed. In Iraq, the U.S. Army looted millions of dollars worth of um, worth of gold and artifacts as well um, from that culture in Iraq, and took that to um, to the U.S. right or or sold that you know on the black market. Um, and so, col colonialism, the colonizers, um, Zionists used the same tactics, right? Um, and and we know many of those tactics, um, but we're all spread out throughout the world. And so many times they they take advantage of that. And so as much as we can join organizations, connect our struggles, be coordinated in our actions, that's really one of the main ambitions of this work. Um, because you know I, we we obviously need to be more organized. Um, but I think with with all the folks here doing this work is is a big part of that, right? And connecting. And I know a lot of folks are already connecting um, over email. And that will only build with this series and with the work. So I think, um, as my comrades mentioned, I, I feel positively about, you know, what has already been said and the connections that are already being made so that we can be coordinated um, and that we can throw off this imperialist yoke.
Yes. Um, thank you, comrades, for sharing that. There's definitely a lot of interconnectedness. The liberation of Puerto Rico is the liberation of Palestine and and all um, struggles. Uh, I hand it over to Brianna and we'll get ready to close out. If folks have any questions, um, please feel free to post them. Um, otherwise, we're going to get ready to start wrapping things up. Uh, Monisha is going to close us out today. Thank you. Um, so I, I really just want to say from my heart, thank you to Black Alliance for Peace for initiating the Zone of Peace campaign, for, for creating the organizing space for us all to come together from diff the different directions in our region um, to start building, to start thinking and start having the conversations about how the grassroots effort to achieve a Zone of Peace can go. Um, we have a future, we have possibility, we have each other, and we have the capability of achieving the goal. Um, so uh, thank you to um, every single comrade that's here. Thank you to our co-organizers in Diaspora Palante Collective, the two chapters of New York Boricua Resistance. Thank you to every attendee. Thank you to Carla for doing interpretation for us. Uh, thank you for everyone's patience while we work through technical challenges. Um, we, as you all know, we're all going in a bunch of different directions responding to, to the atrocities that are being committed. Um, and throwing this together was was a, a monumental feat at times when, when all of our, everybody was going to protest and, and really showing support for Palestine, for Haiti, for Congo. So... I just want to congratulate everybody too for, for getting this done. And we will stay in touch with you. Please stay in touch with us. Our next aspects of this series will be coming up when when we'll let you know. Um, we're going to be unpacking hybrid warfare in a colonial context and breaking down various aspects of it. Um, so also, if there are any things that you want to know more about, about the Puerto Rican struggle that we can touch on in future sessions, um, and if there are thoughts and ideas of how we can collaborative, collaboratively build an international solidarity movement with the liberation of Puerto Rico as we're building all of the other solidarity movements as well, we would love that. Thank you all so much. Stay safe. Um, and don't stop talking about Haiti. Don't stop talking about Palestine. Don't stop talking about Congo. We can do this. <laughs>